So we, yeah. Okay, everyone, I think we should get started. That's okay. Probably people will be filtering in periodically, but the good thing is all of you in the back have the back seats covered, and so they'll have to sit in the front. That's good, although it's not a lecture, so I don't think they're going to be asking you questions. Uh, I'll keep the introduction short because I think what we want to do is to hear from them. Um, I think we owe it to ourselves to really listen to what they have to say, and probably also more than that, what I'd like you to do is not just to listen, but to hear, because undoubtedly they're going to talk about things that are of interest to you, and what I'd like you to do is to listen to those things in such a way that you will be prepared to ask them questions and engage with them and pick their brains about any number of things. Likely between the five of them, they know where all the bodies are buried, so you can ask them about that. Uh, or any number of other things that are probably topically relevant to you. My name is Jeremy Meir. I'm the director of the Wagner Center for Civic Engagement and Public Policy. In other words, I'm the guy who's been sending you the emails over the last few days. So, you know, now you can put a face with a name. Um, what I'd also like to do is, as a segue into the introduction is to actually introduce one of them who will be the roundtable uh, moderator, and that's Greg Kilburn. And I want to say two things about him. Um, first, for those of us who live on the I-20 corridor, you're, if you are at all sensitive to news and the goings-on of Louisiana politics, more than likely you get your information from him because he writes for the US, USA News Network and the Gannett Papers. Uh, and if you don't, you should. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, for his homecoming, he is actually an alumnus of Louisiana Tech, 1984 graduate in journalism in a program which, uh, probably importantly, uh, his father, more so than many, anyone else, I should say, uh, did more to actually create and brand in its distinctiveness. So in a certain sense, this is his homecoming and we welcome him. So join me in welcome, welcoming him today. I do appreciate being here at my, it is my homecoming. I, my, uh, my grandparents graduated from here, my parents, myself, my brother, sister. I've got a nephew right there in the audience who's, who's here. So this is a, a generational thing for me. But I wanted to introduce my friends, um, and sometimes competitors, but we, we stick together when we can. So this is Jeremy Alford. He's the ultimate insider down in Baton Rouge. LawPolitics.com, he's the publisher of. He's got many platforms. If you want to know, if you like inside the inside scoop, Jeremy's on top of that. He's also, well, we're going to talk some about the election. He literally wrote the book on that, uh, about the election between Governor Edwards and uh, David Vitter. So that's Jeremy, he's a great guy. My friend Elizabeth, she's with The Advocate. She's a social media whiz. She's got more followers, I think, than anybody up here at this table. And uh, she is a pleasure to be around as well. Melinda, we call the capital ace. She's with Associated Press. She's amazing, knows more. When I need something, when I have to ask advice, I go to Melinda. And she is amazing, especially on the budget. She knows more about the budget than most of your lawmakers, I can assure you of that. And at the end, my friend Julie O'Donoghue, she's from the Times-Picune, NOLA.com. Julie has been here now for three years. She really, I think three, maybe four, I'm sorry, four. And, uh, but she immediately, uh, what I admire about her is she immersed herself into uh, Louisiana, the politics, the culture, and she does a lot of deep dives that, that I'm not able to do. She did, this year she did a lot of work with the justice reform. So everybody here, uh, uh, other than me, are, are experts. And so we just wanted to start off kind of looking back at the last two years uh, and maybe framing that 2015 election that was really spectacular that we all covered and exciting. Jeremy, as I said, you wrote the book on it. What, what, do you, what would you like to share? Uh, I appreciate the invitation to, to be here. I always enjoy uh, visiting uh, Ruston. Um, I think we may not recognize it now, but I think there is going to be a day that comes when we're all sitting on our porches drinking iced tea and talking about those times when everybody had to have iPhones. And we'll look back at the 14, 15, 16, that extended three-year election cycle, where we'll, we'll realize that that's where the wave broke and rolled back. And that's when everything changed in Louisiana politics as we knew it. Uh, 2015, 
hosted the most expensive race for governor ever waged on Louisiana soil. Uh, it's the first time Super PACs ever played in a stateside race. 2014 hosted the most expensive U.S. Senate race uh, ever waged on Louisiana soil. We had another Senate race in 2015. Uh, we saw a, le a legislature and a legislature seated uh, during that same time frame, and uh, I, I still think that this term, uh, the most important political event will be the election of Teller Barra as House Speaker. Um, it really helped reshape uh, the, 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 the landscape. Uh, those doors have been kicked open in Louisiana politics, and there's no closing them. Uh, at the same time, the Edwin Edwards era was replaced by the Bobby Jindal era, which has been replaced by the John Bell Edwards era, and it's ushered in a new kind of politician that doesn't want to campaign on the on the fly or speak on, on the cuff. Um, for someone like me who covers Louisiana politics, it's, it's a sad day. Um, on the campaign trail, the days of going to every single fair and festival, eating an alligator on a stick, kissing babies, going to ask for football games, those things have been replaced in statewide races. Uh, and that's trickling down, it's being replaced by data and metrics, uh, numbers that tells the candidate, look, you only need to focus on this part of the state, really you only need to focus on this parish, actually you only need to focus on this neighborhood, you only need to focus on these doors, ignore all the other doors. Uh, it's become so specific that, that we've lost the art of retail politics. It's not completely dead, uh, but it is changing and transforming and, and uh, dying off from, from the time we knew it. Um, and I think that's that's, where we're at you know, after, after those you know, pivotal three years. And there's been great changes in kind of the, the mood and the, the, the way the legislature operates now than it did when I first started covering it, maybe when you guys did too. And this election kind of set the stage for a divided government. Um, and, and of course, you guys are on the ground the whole time along, me too. But what have you seen, you know, in these first, in, as, as we move forward in those first two years? Anybody? Okay, well, I'll take that one. I, I feel like we, what you see now is um, there, for a long time during the Blanco era and the Jindal era, you saw the starting of partisan politics in Louisiana, but now we partisanship has arrived. It is in the legislature. It is um, how all the decisions seem to be vetted and debated, and it, it is the central, it will be, what John Bell Edwards' um, administration and terms are known for if he has one term or two, which we don't yet know, obviously. But um, as Jeremy alluded to, with the, with the House finally electing its own speaker with no input from the governor, that's, that's a rare thing. I mean, uh, normally in Louisiana politics, the legislative leadership is, is if not directly chosen by the governor, pretty closely um, influenced by the governor and heavily so. And the House uh, bought the governor's choice and went with their own choice. And what you see now is a partisan divide between very conservative House Republicans and uh, the Democratic governor's office. And that has shaped the first two years of, that, of this term so far. It will shape the next two years of the term. And it will be the recurring theme that you see in almost every story coming out of the, cap the Capitol um, that you read. And Julie and uh, Elizabeth, there's also uh, a, a divide really between the House and the Senate, <laughs> as well as the House and the Governor's Office, right? Right, I think, we're, I think we're kind of starting to see a little bit of what we're seeing on a national stage where there is, the Democratic Party has been relegated to this point where now you have the um, Republican Party is starting to show some of the early signs of fracturing within the party. And I think that that's kind of the direction that we're um, heading in is you're going to see um, some more splintering within the Republican Party where it sets up a, a really a new dynamic in Louisiana politics. I, I, I think, I think Elizabeth's probably right in that you're seeing like a more partisan um, dynamic, but I tend to try to push back when people say that our state politics is becoming like our national politics because the stakes are different, right? So in Congress, when I say I'm never going to raise taxes, that doesn't usually mean I have to cut because I run a deficit. Like, congressmen can go around and say they're not raising taxes all they want. They're running a deficit. They don't have to cut. In state politics, you have to have a balanced budget, which means that there's a trade-off, right? Either you have the revenue or you get the revenue through taxes, fees, whatever, or you make cuts. And I think 
Um, if we look to what's happened in some other states like Kansas, who are kind of a little more advanced down a, a very uh, conservative anti-tax uh, road, they've had a blowback from moderates uh, in their state because people didn't like the cuts after a while. They didn't want to cut the University of Kansas. They didn't want to cut education. So I think even though we're seeing kind of what's happening on the national stage in, in the state, there are also different stakes. I mean, if you're the representative for this area, uh, Representative Shadowin, I think is our local representative here, uh, and you're looking at a vote for taxes or a vote to cut tech, uh, not to go to the heart of things here, uh, I, think, I think that's a much harder choice than what people in Congress typically face. It doesn't, you're not going home to your constituents and people are saying, you know, I haven't had a raise in 10 years, and you know, I, I don't know if I can send my kid to this local university because I see things happening that I don't like. So, I, I do think that state politics is a little different than what's happening in the national debate where it's, where it's a lot more theoretical. If they had to cut defense or close down bases or raise taxes, would they, would they be having a different discussion? I'll, I'll add quickly that, um, it, just, just so you all know, it, I do something a little bit different than, than three others here at this table. I don't necessarily cover breaking news or spot news. Or even news per se, I cover politics, and more of our color, cover politics in Louisiana. And I think Elizabeth's right that that mentality has certainly invaded the political side of Louisiana uh, government. Um, there's a reason that you heard the treasurer candidates uh, talk about immigration and a couple other federal issues. Uh, some of it has to do with the fact that it's just a really boring office and you don't want to hear these people talk about investment portfolios. Uh, the other is that you also heard it in the governor's race. You talk about immigration and, uh, and Syrian refugees and, and uh, a, a variety of issues that have nothing to do with the office that Louisiana, running. the office they're running for, and more to do with D.C. Part, part of that has to do with the super PACs that we talked about earlier. And if you don't know, super PACs were allowed by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2010 in a decision that liking uh, free speech to money. And uh, these groups are, are, are playing more in Louisiana. A lot of the money can be traced to out-of-state partners, uh, mostly in Virginia and D.C., which I think is driving part of that rhetoric as well. Well, one thing I've no noticed is that there is there is greater rigidity among both all, all partisans uh, factors within, especially within the House right now. I remember the Senate president now is John Alero, who was had been the House Speaker, and he's a legend in you know, state politics. He's been there since the 70s. And a long time ago, I remember, and he told, I'm sure he's told my friends this too, but I remember years ago he said, Greg, the folks might get mad at you for raising taxes, but they'll never forgive you if you close a hospital or a university. But I don't think that's necessarily true anymore. Now, I don't think that, uh, I think there are people within, you know, within the, within the legislature who feel strongly that uh, no matter what, there shouldn't be any more spending. If something has to close, it has to close. And I think their constituents back them up. And I think part of that is because of uh, the way of redistricting. They're, everyone's Republicans and Democrats now are speaking to the choir. They're, whatever district they're in is so um, is so Democratic or so Republican that they are so conservative, so liberal that there that, that there's no one to, there's no pushback. There's no consequences for them specifically. But I'd say uh, on that point. Two things. One, I think that has been helped along by term limits. Um, the advent of term limits has, has meant the new crop of legislators who have come in have been more partisan um, and more rigid in, in some of their ideology. And in, some of it is because they only have 12 years in one chamber, so they're always looking to the next job that they may be running for. So that changes the political dynamic as opposed to just being comfortable in the seat that you're in and assuming that, that your people are going to keep reelecting you. And also, I think that is what you're talking about with redistricting is some of what the difference is between the House and the Senate. The House districts, because they're smaller, they're drawn in a much more partisan fashion uh, because they can be. So they're super packed with Republicans or super packed with Democrats. And so you only have to play to that base. Whereas in the Senate districts, there's a broader um, cross section of constituents that you have to deal with. So you have a little less rigidity. You have the ability to be a little less rigid, I think, in your thinking because. Um, 
you aren't playing to just one base, you have a broader array of constituents that you have to answer to. And I don't know that we've seen that that is actually true. I mean, I think I think when we when the cut came down on tops, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. I mean, remember that happened because the house refused to cut hosp cut hospitals. I mean, clearly there were enough people in the legislature including some Republicans who were like, oh my lord, the idea that you're going to close my hospital is terrifying or that my hospital might close as a result is terrifying. I do think the House leadership, particularly Representative Cameron Henry, he's okay with closing a hospital, but he lives in Jefferson Parish where there are tons of, there, I mean, he's there are the, lots of hospitals. He's the appropriations chairman. Yeah, but I don't know that I feel I think I'd have to see where they were closing to really know how how much those Republicans really would be okay with that. And like they hadn't done it yet, but it's come to the brink and then, you know, band-aids along. So we hadn't seen the ultimate showdown, but very quickly, what were some legislative successes or failures uh, in these first two years, that could, uh, in, in your opinion, the, the major ones? Anybody? I don't think you would call the, the budget or tax situation a success. Um, no matter which side of the philosophical debate you're on, what the legislature has done so far is rather than come up with a permanent solution for determining what they want the size and shape of the budget to be, they've kind of temporarily band-aided their way through it. Um, so either eventually they, I mean, they, they use temporary taxes to get them to a certain point uh, to fill in gaps in the budget, but those taxes expire on July 1st, and now they have a new budget hold that is basically self-created. So at some point, um, in theory, you would probably want the legislature to either shrink spending to match the actual amount of revenue they have coming in every year, or increase taxes to match the level of spending they want to continue, and they've not done either one of those things so far. They've just kind of patched their way through for a very long time and they haven't made any decisions. I think along those lines it's important to note when you ask Governor Edwards what the most significant accomplishment is, it was not done through <laughs> legislative action, it was Medicaid expansion which he did through an executive order which has been the most significant policy change Absolutely. in the state in the, sure. in the past two sure. years. Sure um, and that the legislature didn't didn't even wasn't even involved in that. That's right. He's, he's, um he, he did have some gestures for form this year that was that was important, uh, but the but the most sweeping, you're right. The most sweeping uh, event was definitely the executive order to to bring in the Medicaid expansion. Whether or not it holds or not, we'll see. But, um, as we look now, as we move toward the current situation, and the most urgent and pressing issues, of course, we it's all been mentioned already. The the, the looming uh, one billion dollar somewhere around there cliff um, is that clear do you think Julie is, is is that the most pressing issue moving into this year into next year oh yeah I think um, I think the the budget gap or what we call the fiscal cliff which is the billion plus hole that will open up in the budget when certain taxes roll off. Mostly sales taxes, mostly a sales tax increase and some exemptions for sales taxes that don't exist right now but that will come back. Um, a big one is business utilities. Usually you don't pay sales tax on business utilities but right now they're paying it but then it's going to roll off. Uh, I think that's definitely the biggest, the biggest issue and I think the thing that's not being talked about very much publicly about that issue is the reason we had they increased the sales tax to keep services where they are the first time was because they didn't have other options even if they had wanted to increase the income tax which they did not want to do but even if they had wanted to they couldn't do it and bring in the money they needed to fast enough and I think if we keep delaying doing anything up until July 1st I mean, we're pretty much back in a situation come this spring where they got to extend the sales tax in order to keep the same revenue coming in. If you change other types of taxes, there's a delay before that kicks in, and then you have a gap open up. So they're going to need, I think, they're on a timeline where they need some sort of bridge, which I know people are talking about in the capital, but I'm not sure the public is aware of that. Like if, 
unless they want to reduce everything, they're going to have to kind of, I, I don't know. They're, they, they can't, they've passed the point, in my opinion, where they can do a full, full scale tax reform where they could really change things around and not have a gap where they don't have enough money coming in. So, uh, uh, Elizabeth, where will this bridge, uh, will it be in the form of a, uh, be determined in the form of a special session and a Mardi Gras session, a, a Valentine's session? What do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think we're probably due for another special session. Uh, one thing to remember is that most of these budget issues cannot even be dealt with during the um, regular session because it's a general session, which means, I mean, when you want to talk about legislative issues coming up in the coming year, um, just the nature of those sessions tend to be when you get the um, more unusual bills, I, I would say. So um, I expect that we'll probably see a lot of things driven by um, Trump's agenda, particularly given how um, overwhelmingly he won in Louisiana. I think um, we'll see uh, legislation that kind of mimics some of the priorities that he's put out there. What do you think, Melinda? Well, I'd say just as a, a primer for anybody who maybe isn't as familiar with the legislative process as we are, because we're about to be in an even numbered year, they can't deal with taxes in the regular session. So if they want to deal with taxes at all, they have to have a special session. So that's the first thing to know. And the, the second thing to know, and the reason the focus always tends to be on the House of Representatives is because most tax bills have to start there. So that's kind of why we, there's so much focus in, the, in our conversation and in all the stuff you read about special sessions and uh, the House of Representatives. Um, but um, it, it seems as though they may almost be on track to continue to do some sort of temporary tax structure, which Jeremy and I both started in the Foster administration. And when we first started, they, that was what they had then, where it was temporary taxes that expired every two years. And they had to come back and, and argue and debate and bicker over temporary taxes and whether to renew them. And it, it almost seems as though that they are so divided in, in how they feel about um, the budget situation and the fiscal situation that um, they may be about to embark on a, a repeat of where we were 17, 20 years ago where there were temporary taxes that keep getting approved and then fall away and then get approved again. So, But it is definitely, it, it, the budget and tax situation is the thing that sucks up all the oxygen in the capital right now because they're in this cycle where they are constantly debating taxes or cuts, taxes or cuts, and they don't decide anything permanently. So it, it sucks up almost all the attention all the time. So what are they whispering to you, Jeremy? What's going to happen? What's your forecast? I think the most important thing heading into next year is, is not a budget or taxes. I think a lot of these these revenue issues are that might be a surprise to the president of the year. <laughs> a lot of these a lot of these issues I think are, are rather simple to solve and, and we've seen previous legislatures do more with less. Uh, they've been faced with uh, bigger shortfalls. Other states have over, overcome it. We certainly have some talented politicians in that building to pull it off but the problem is I think it just boils down to communications. You, you have uh, layers of communication problems at, at the Capitol. Right now you have the governor who has been meeting with the speaker I think at least three times now. Uh, the speaker and the governor are telling everyone that those meetings have been cordial and that everyone's getting along. Uh, meanwhile the speaker on the side has decided to be the chairman of a new uh, PAC called Louisiana Speaks <coughs> who sent uh, invitations and letters out to donors saying that they wanted to be able to combat a governor's uh, persuasion and uh, even do some media buys in the spring. Um, I've heard anecdotally that it could also be used for research and maybe even some type of side staff for the, the House GOP and the budget debate. This is unprecedented. We've never had a PAC play directly in the political process at the Capitol on behalf of lawmakers who are also involved with the PAC. <clears throat> so, you know, you have to ask yourself exactly what is going on with those conversations between the government and the House. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the House, uh, it, as somebody mentioned, that it's, it's a fractured House. Um, there are a lot of different people saying a lot of different things and if you look at the overview of the Capitol, we've seen, seen the same pattern play out and that begins with the governor who comes out with the revenue raiser which is a fancy way of saying taxes. The House reacts almost violently and says, well, you know, we can't do that, we can do a dollar. That's all we can do, a dollar. Uh, the Senate comes and the Senate tries to play this middle ground. Uh, they traditionally been with the governor and at one point I think House leaders asked the Senate to negotiate with the Senate and the Senate the governor and then they went back to the governor and 
Um, it's just communications. I mean, folks need to get on the same page. A lot of it is driven by politics. A lot of it is driven by personality. But at the end, the end of the day, it's just a damn mess. And, and I think it's, that's, that's what the remainder of this term is going to be like. So one thing I've noticed in this off season that where I think we discussed it among ourselves, uh, where we're, uh, the governor might have made a mistake in his the first time is he didn't really hustle any any kind of uh, of his agenda, not around the state. He's doing that now. He's he's going to different. He's speaking to, to groups, of businesses. Uh, almost every week he's going somewhere. He's talking to lawmakers. And the previous governor, Jindal, uh, whether he was your favorite or whether you didn't like him. He knew how to hustle his agenda. I mean, he would go to every, if you're in Ruston, you saw him up here three or four times, whether it be on ethics or privatization of the charity hospital system. He was around the state beating the drum for his Except agenda. Except for that tax plan. Well, that, that was dead <laughs> on arrival, right? Yeah, it was parked. It was parked. But, but Governor Edwards didn't do that the first time, but I, I sense that he is trying to, trying to build some support uh, throughout the state this time. Is, is that your sense too? I think he's at least trying to look like this. Yeah. Well. That was one of the things that was the most baffling thing to me is if you come out with this big grand plan, which everybody approached with skepticism that CAT and all of that, um, it was a tax that he had <coughs> proposed. But um, that, that was the thing that was most baffling to me is when you talk to people, no one ever really felt like he had courted support it was and it, it kind of goes back to um, a mentality of I'm the governor I set the agenda which is long held in Louisiana politics um, he probably should have you know quickly learned that that wasn't how things were going to be when um, his pick for speaker wasn't the person who ended up becoming speaker but um, it does, it does seem that he's at least trying to get the appearance um, of some buy-in this time. And I would say he's, some of the different approaches, last, um, for the last part of the tax debate, the governor seemed to be at odds with the business community. Um, that seemed to be a pretty um, obvious area of disagreement was he spent a lot of time talking about how businesses are not, quote, paying their fair share. And he seemed to have a much more antagonistic relationship with the various business lobbying groups and business organizations. And so this time around, he is having all of these closed door meetings around the state with business leaders. Now they will, and they release the list of who he's been meeting with and, and who he's talking with. Um, he's deliberately shut out the business lobbying organizations and seems to be going directly to the business community. So, so whether this will actually change the dynamic of the debate remains very unclear, but it does seem as though he is responding to the fact that the last go-round where he made business sort of the, the whipping boy for the tax discussion he was having this time, he seems to be changing that approach. So will the... will. What will, what, will, what will be done in the regular session this time? I mean, the, the, obviously the focus is going to be on the on this special session, if there is one, and, and trying to raise money. The governor's trying to raise money to replace the, the, the temporary sales tax. I mean, what is there? Is there anything on the horizon? That's I, I think uh, one thing we can talk about. You know, there are a lot of other states. North Carolina is a good example. Texas, that are being sort of eaten up by what we would call social issues, so um, issues that concern uh, LGBT people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, bathroom bathroom access, um, oh gosh, <coughs> monument legislation, Confederate monument, protecting Confederate monuments, and I think um, one of the reasons those, we, we have those debates in Louisiana, but um, a lot of those things are kind of stopped short because the Senate president has structured committees such that uh, certain divisive issues go to a committee uh, that's majority Democrat and they kill the issue. So for example, we had a monument to protect or a bill to protect Confederate monuments last year that got out of the House. The Senate president has a committee set up that's majority Democrat even though the Senate itself is majority Republican. The bill goes to that committee and it gets killed. So it's strange because I feel like Louisiana is not having 
the same debate around certain social issues that other conservative states are having. Um, and and, and I, a lot of that's by design because the Senate president doesn't like divisive issues and he doesn't want to be distracted by things he thinks are distracting. They may be important to you or me or someone else, but he doesn't like that type of thing. He wants to focus on other issues. Um, I, I, so that's a good question, Greg. I don't know what they're going to do in the regular session that's not messing around with the budget. But uh, Jeremy's is itching to say that he's, he's probably going to call a joke. No, it's, it's no joke. <laughs> this is serious. Um, no, I, I reported in, in the Tuesday tracker today, which is it's a, it's a easy to digest kind of di digest of uh, Louisiana politics. It's free. It's absolutely free. It comes out every Tuesday. You can sign up for it at LAPolitics.com. LAPolitics.com. Um, LA but Representative Paul Hollis is going to introduce legislation that quote prohibits manufacturers and distributors from price gouging on the sale of off-patient and generic drugs. We saw this this debate kind of peek its head. Uh, this year in the regular session about drug pricing. Oh, that's uh, questionable how much state has any authority in the yeah. issue since federal laws yeah. govern that. And but it, that doesn't stop them from talking And about that it. lawmaker and has it, introduced and it's, it. And it's the, it, it was the Lobbyist Paycheck Protection Act of the year. That means every lobbyist at the Capitol had a piece of it. Uh, they'll probably have a piece of this. Again, it's taken off in other states. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Secretary of State Tom Scheller is trying to find a sponsor for legislation that would allow for the appointment of certain elected officials when they resign, when there's time remaining in their term. For example, if uh, John Kennedy, uh, this law would have been in, on the books when John Kennedy won the U.S. Senate and resigned, uh, we would not be having a special election for treasurer right now. Uh, it's one of his ideas to, to increase turnout. I think we're going to see a handful of Medicaid bills uh, filed next, next year as well. Okay. Um, it, it could end up being a, a, a session of health care policy. Huh? Uh, there's going to be a bill filed to try and get Medicaid patients to, tr uh, to pay copay in order to get services. So you'll see some stuff like that. You'll see, you also see more um, uh, criminal justice discussion in terms of continuing to, to, to deal with things that they didn't finish dealing with during the last session when they were debating that issue. Well, there was a copay bill last year, this, this year, whatever year we're still in that the governor supported, but it never even peeked its head out of committee. That's the, coming back I think up. the hospitals uh, the and I think we'll, we'll, see, we'll see constitutional convention legislation again, which will not pass. But I think it's going to it's going to build into an election issue for 2019. So very quickly. That uh, hand's raised over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Since we're talking about legislative distractions, um, I wanted to ask a question about this past spring's biggest legislative distraction which was Senate Bill 1 to rename the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts to the Jimmy Davis Senior Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts. Um, there was a lot of uh, vote trading going on there. They were so overwhelmed with phone calls, letters, emails, and in-person lobbying from alumni that legislators were literally begging people to leave them alone. <laughs> And yet, they still voted in favor of this bill, despite the uproar against it. So I'm curious um, how you guys, are, if you can explain why they dealt with that bill in the way that they did. Were they actually welcoming a distraction from the bigger issue, the budget issue? Um, was it just vote trading? Was there something else going on? And I realized that it's, it's, a, it's sort of an inconsequential issue, it was a, it was but it became a huge deal that kind of, I think, exposed the underbelly of the legislature. It was strictly a legacy issue. In other words, they, they, it was one of their own, and they, they, they ignored the, um, uh, the, those the, who opposed it, and that, that was basically it, I mean, pretty much, right? <laughs> One of the things that is very striking about that whole ordeal is just how much of a grassroots outreach to, you know, talk, you talk to every legislator and their phone's ringing off the hooks, they're getting so many emails. And I had more than one remark to me that if they ever were lobbied that aggressively on, okay. you know, any other issue, you know, um, it would kind of give them a better indication of 
where people stand on those things and justification for action. I think and Jimmy Long, I'm sorry, I think we said Davis, who, Jimmy Davis, who's a famous governor, but it was yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Long. Jimmy Long. Right. Yeah, Jimmy Long. I, I think to like put it more bluntly, I mean, if you are a lawmaker and your colleague is related to the person who the school's being named after, and his wife had just passed away, his wife that everyone loved, and he's sitting there and staring at you, Asking you to vote for it. Asking right. you to vote for it, and he has got gotten the whole Senate to tell you this is important to us as a body. At the end of the day, it's hard it's hard for them to you're, say you're, no. You're Just no like it would be hard for you to say no to your, your coworker. I'm not saying that that makes it okay. I saw the outreach too, but like I think you know the personal relationship of legislators matters in these things. And I think he really wanted the, the bill, you know? I mean, so, I don't know. It is, it is clear that it's not a moment that if you are a constituent of a legislator who spent a lot of time lobbying them, this would not be the moment that you feel like your voice has been heard. Right. right. That is clear. For I mean, sure. Um, and yes, did they get inundated with a lot of phone calls and letters and emails? They did, and they all talked about it. But. I would say it seemed as though it was an overwhelming issue to some more than others. Lots of people just went on about their day dealing with other stuff and and it was not um, a driving issue to some of the members of the legislature as much as it was to others. Um, but it, it was clear that it was not one of those moments that if you were a person who had spent time showing up and trying to present a case that you would feel like your legislators are responsive to how your to what your opinions because the only people who sat at the table to that I saw to support the bill were the sponsor of the bill and then the senator whose relative was going to have the school named after him and everybody else who sat at the table generally speaking was an opponent to the bill so um, it, I'm sure to people watching it was not a pleasant um, thing to watch the politics of it I also like one more one more point like I I, I understand and you the people who oppose that bill overwhelms them for sure and I understand the frustration but regularly law legislators like I'm talking maybe that week are hearing from people who are coming to them and saying my child is gonna die if you cut this service I mean that's not an overstatement like my child will die I don't know how I'm gonna take care of my child if you cut this service uh, I, last year, because of criminal justice reform, there were a lot of people who were coming forward who said that their close relative had been murdered, and if you make this change, you know, I'm gonna be up at night, all night, you know, having night terror. So, I mean, legislators, the volume was a lot, but legislators hear very dramatic things all session long, and I, you know, I, 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 they're having to respond to a lot, a lot of, a lot of things. Um, I'm not trying to give them an out, but you know they hear some very hard things to hear a lot. Um, and, you know, I mean, at the end of session, they may be thinking about those things and not this thing. And if Senator Long's going to support them on something else, on this thing about this child dying, and you know, okay, fine, we're going to name this school after you know, after you know your relative. So I, know, I, know, I know you said you, you thought you saw the underbelly of the state capitol. I think I've seen it a couple of times. I'm not sure that's it. It may have seen like a toe or a toenail or something. Well, the underbelly part was when the sponsoring senator made a promise to the school to do one thing and then changed his mind about it and then lied about it. That well, was the underbelly part. We're coming. We're going to come back to, to the audience, I promise. But we wanna, there's just a couple more things we want to talk about. Um, first of all, real quickly, just to yes or no, Will the cliff be solved, Jeremy? <laughs> or, or were you going no, hurtling off it? Not long term, no. Okay. Yeah, I was about to ask, what do you mean by solved? <laughs> you, long term? Or? Um, they'll do something, but. <laughs> Melinda? I mean, they're required to balance the budget yes, under the Constitution, so at some point they will have to do that, yes. Will they have? Will they replace the revenue? I should have said that. Earlier. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't bet any money in either direction on that one. Julia? No. No. Okay, there you go. So, coming up, well, Jeremy, all of us talked about this really fascinating election that we had in 2015, and we don't want to leave here today without talking about the 2019 
election cycle. Right. Which um, you got to you yes. got to you got to I've been I've been writing about it already. Um, but you've got uh, a governor who is um, still I would say I'd say he has good approval ratings right now, but he's the last Democrat standing in a statewide office, and so that puts him in great peril. No matter how popular he is, no matter how much money he has, and he'll have plenty. So, well, how do you see it playing out? Start with you, Jeremy. You're the insider. Um, there's going to be a big shift in the legislature uh, due to term limits. There are going to be 50, at least at least 51 seats open up in the legislature. That's more than a third uh, turnover. There's going to be more than 51. There are going to be state reps who want to run for Senate seats. Uh, there are going to be people who not who do not run again. Uh, so it's going to be higher than that. But that's still a pretty you know huge turnover. Uh, so we're going to have more than a third of the legislature on the first day next year, looking trying to find out where the bathrooms are. Um, there's also two years from now. Two, huh? two years from now. Okay. Um, <laughs> then we also have a big governor. We have a big governor's race. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, Gregory Todd Hilburn wrote a story earlier this year on the developing field for governor, and it listed a bunch of names, which which is. You know, if you walk into the Capitol during session and throw a rock in any direction, you're going to hit somebody who'll say they'll at least think about running for governor. Uh, but I think the real story wasn't the names in that story. It was the fact the story was ever written. Like, can you imagine Edwin Edwards in the first year of his first term having to deal with a newspaper writing a story about who's going to run against him? Uh, it's pretty amazing, though, that you know U.S. John, U.S. Senator John Kennedy or Majority Whip Steve Scalise could jump into this race and immediately be on equal footing with the governor. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think uh, that, that any modern governor who <coughs> sought re-election ended up in, in, that, in that state where from the get-go they were on equal footing with one of, one of two people who could get into this race. But it's a long list. There, there's a, just a, a ton of people who's looking for it. Uh, if you go search uh, Greg Hilburn uh, and uh, Governor's Race 2019, you'll Please do. It'll, 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 it'll pull up a list. I think um, one of the things that uh, will be interesting about uh, the Governor's Race is, um, first of all, Louisiana elections are in an off cycle. Um, John Bell Edwards will be the Democrat nationally with a target on his back that year. Um, the Republicans nationally would love nothing more than to pick him off, you know, claim that as a scalp. Um, and so I think that just as we saw the most expensive governor's race ever, I think we're head definitely 100% heading toward um, that being talked. And I, th I think you're right. I think it's going to be explosive. And I think it's going to be a national race because, as, as you said, the Republicans are in play, but Democrats are looking at this seat. And they're, they're thinking, well, you know, redistricting is in 2021, census in 2020. Uh, we need a governor with veto authority to protect, protect those election lines. Are you so, write so another book about it? Democrats, uh, no. Um, the Democrats are going to come down, national Democrats are going to come down and, uh, and, and put a lot of money into this. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you also have to look at it. Uh, John Bell Edwards is the only Democratic governor in the Deep South. So, I mean, he's, he's got a target for lots of reasons. He already has raised more than $3 million, so he's going to have raised a lot of money. But there are already PACs that have been formed specifically to target him and run against him, like support anybody who's running against him and just attack him and his record. So that's already formed, and we're two years out from the election. So that has, you've really not seen that in Louisiana politics before in a governor's race. So it kind of sets up how expensive it's going to be and how many outside influences are going to be trying to play in this camp campaign. I agree with everything that everyone said. I'd also say in 2013, which happened to be the year I started working in Louisiana, uh, no one was saying John Bell Edwards was going to be our governor. So I think we're two years out from 2019. It's very... I would say even you know earlier in 2015, you probably would have had this panel and people would not have said John Bell Edwards is going to be the governor. I mean, people were still talking about if any Democrat they were talking about any Democrat having a having a good shot, it was Mitch. So Landrieu. Um, so I I think two years out, it's hard to it's hard to say what's going to happen. And I think anyone who tells you that they know what's going to happen, you know, like the outcome of the race probably needs to reflect a little bit more. Yeah, I don't think anyone can I don't think anyone can predict that race right now, but I think you can <laughs> predict it's gonna be very fractious. And I mean the, the you've got a US a sitting US senator who now every chance he gets he called me twice last week just to get a shot at it, you know, at the governor. He 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 called last week to endorse 
uh, the Republican who's running for treasurer, which which apparently nobody cared about. <laughs> but it was like three, what was it, two or three sentences before he got to mention the name of the guy he's going door. He leads off with, you know, John Bell which is leading the state. So it's going to be a, 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 I think, a fun two years. But we wanted to leave plenty of time to, if anybody had questions or engagement, ask anybody on the panel. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of effect uh, do you think the criminal justice reform will, will have, if any, on the budget? Budget. It's a Julie question. Um, so, very minimal. Uh, it, it, it's about saving a little over seventy million dollars. They like to say it's going to save. I forget what the two fifty two. But the fact is, most of that money, the quote savings that they're talking about in this two hundred fifty two million dollars over ten years, is actually money that they're cycling right back into the department to hopefully prevent people for, from going to prison. So essentially it's supposed to be better services, right? Mental health, drug court, uh, things that keep you out of prison, but still cost money. So when you're looking at savings of $72 million over, over 10, 10 years. years, I mean, $7 million in the state budget is, you know, the health department loses that type of money right That's around the area. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't think it's gonna be a big savings. I know that's a big talking point about it, um, but I I think that ultimately it's mostly about, this is my opinion, doing better by people, right? I think everyone, there is almost universal agreement that having this high of an incarcerated population is not good for our, our economics, it's not good for our culture, it's not good for kids in particular, really bad for kids. So um, I think it's more about trying to make sure people aren't taken away from their families and trying to make sure that, you know, people are actually getting the services that they need and not just getting thrown into jail for no reason. I, d I do think that has the potential to be one of the riskiest pieces of legislation passed by this generation of Louisiana politicians. You know, we, we said the governor has a target on his back and, and he endorsed his plan. And how many? inmates on November 1st? 1,400. 1,400 nonviolent inmates are going to be released on November 1st and if you don't think there's a group of Republican operatives who are looking for a list of those 1,400 names to track over the next year and a half, you're insane. And that list has been posted online already so what they're going to do is they're going to track what happens to those and if you ever see one of those inmates who got released early and we're talking like some of them are getting released eight days early, 16 days early, but, but that nuance is going to be lost and if one of those early release inmates um, ever shows up arrested for some sort of crime somewhere, somebody's going to make an ad out of that and you can run it against any legislator who voted for that package, anybody who sponsored it, the governor who was the champion of it. So so there's a lot of tracking that is going to go on with that legislation in terms of what can be used for politically. I want to mention that um, there, there were bills that have been passed in recent years that let out that give parole to people who have committed far more serious offenses, seriously, under Bobby Jindal, that like no one thinks about now. I mean, like no one is like, man, what about those people coming up for parole, you know, based on this legislation that passed a few years ago? I, I think Jeremy's correct. Particularly, the governor is putting a, taking a pretty big risk. And by the way, inmates know that. They will tell you that they think that he's taking a big risk by letting, uh, by by putting himself out in front of this this uh, initiative. I think there's more of a, a recent case study that we can look at. There's a special election in the House District 77 in Covington. Uh, in the primary, the number two and number three people who were polling were pretty tight and uh, the super PAC came in and dropped a commercial that tied her to John Bell Edwards through donations and it told the story of how John Bell Edwards had pardoned this uh, individual last year as a murderer and that the murderer moved back to St. Tammany Parish and uh, that that last minute ad I think probably squeezed that, that woman out of the runoff. Uh, but you see that theme kind of already coming together, and I think it's going to. Oh, I think I even think they, more. I think Republican donors see a winner in that strategy. More so than that, uh, a state senator for decade, decades uh, was one of the leaders of the criminal justice reform. Tried to get elected locally in Jefferson Parish and got completely killed. And a lot of it was because they were the ads that were run against him talked about his support for um, criminal sentencing law changes and. Um, 
suggested that was a bad idea. I want to quickly uh, introduce, I see one of my Louisiana editors came in, Barbara Leader with the New Star. She's the editor of the New Star. Thank you for coming. Who else would like to know something? Yes, sir. Wiley, how are you? <laughs> uh, is Kennedy going to run for governor or is this just the press wanting something to talk about? <laughs> I, I think he's going to run. I think I believe he's going to run. I, I, um, you're probably right. There is some of the, the press liking to talk about the, uh, the rivalry there. Um, the senator does seem to uh, spend a lot of time trash talking the governor, which suggests that maybe he's looking at it and also Republican Party officials are heavily courting him to try to get him to run. So there is an interest in the party to have him run and when you ask him about it, he doesn't say no. He just says he's focused on something else. So he leaves the door open, which you know, anybody in politics knows that just continues the speculation. So he's clearly keeping it alive himself. And I think that he, he gets the first I think he gets the first Right of refusal. Yeah, right of refusal. If he if he wants it, I think that they're more than willing to um, make him the Republican to beat in that race. For a while, it looked like initially, right away, it looked like it would, the Attorney General Jeff Landry might be the one that wanted to run, but he's backed off a little bit since Kennedy has taken the you know the, the forefront of the of the kind of the attacks on the governor. So. Uh, you know, and I think maybe a deal cut there. Somewhere. Well, and Republicans clearly see him as a strong contender if he ran against the, the current governor. They see him as, as one of the strongest options out there because his approval ratings are so high in the state. People really like him here. So he could clearly be a formidable candidate. So I, I think that's why you see his name circulated so much. Greg, I think the question I would also ask to kind of add to that is to the Democrats' credit in 2015, they ran one, they ran one guy. And they let the Republicans, <laughs> Angel and Darnley Bitter, fight it out. Can the Republicans run one single strong candidate that go ahead up against John Bell? If it, if it was if it was a sitting U.S. senator, then yes. If, if not, maybe. Yeah, no. I think I think there are some some Republicans who would. Feel like jumping in anyway. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe. <laughs> the, the, the Republicans don't have a field clear right now. I mean, David Bitter used to get up in there and just throw elbows and talk common sense to people and whatever it took to, to clear a field. And I got, I got a clear field. And I don't see anyone in the party infrastructure who can, who can do that right now. And you see, from um, the Senate race, you know, we had two sitting U.S. congressmen at the yeah. time. Um, Kennedy, who had run statewide previously, um, a public cert, well, that was on the Democrat side, but you know, you had a very um, formidable Republican slate. Nobody was able to get in there and kind of. That's right. Clear. Let me, well, and to yeah. the point of clearing the field, I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, the egos involved in this, people think they are the best candidate, and so it's, it's hard to, to persuade somebody that they shouldn't think they're the best candidate and, and that's just a hard thing to do when in, in this kind of level of politics yeah let me let me let me throw something else your way right <laughs> so in 2015 we saw this field where we had a single democrat and a group of republicans and it, it, long shot the book that we wrote about that cycle we, we focused on recruitment efforts to get an african-american democrat in the race because if a democrat african-american democrat were getting the race it would it would start to eat into to, uh, John Bell's base, his, his targeted part of the electorate, um, and it could force a runoff between two strong Republicans. Um, we interviewed four well-known uh, uh, African American Democrats who, who were put in that situation. Uh, I guess locally, Rick Gallo was. Uh, some folks tried to get him into the race. And he uh, he spoke very openly about how he thought he was being manipulated uh, just to get in there to to, to cut off John Bell Edwards uh, part of his base. So, you know, I think we'll probably see those recruitment efforts again in 2019 as well, which would benefit a heavy Republican bill. So I have two questions. So the first one. Don't be so greedy. <laughs> Sorry. So, so the first one that kind of plays off the, the renaming of the school. And so my question to you all is that we hear sometimes when we call about issues to our representatives about a bill for, for another um, legislators area not necessarily where we live I've been told that they usually support each other's locally impacting bills um, no matter if they're good or bad would you agree or disagree with that and then my second question kind of jumps to a different topic 
But um, so in 2016, there was a bill involving the age of strippers. Um, and then there was an amendment tacked on on the House floor for the weight, uh, weight limits around that. Do you think from then until now that the House has finally decided to focus on the real issues instead of playing around with the other things? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it. I don't think so. But um, so the first question was local bills. I got you, the stripper question dominated because then got, that got all the metrics as we say. But the local bill, yes, generally you don't op oppose a colleague's local bill. If the if the delegation is in agreement, right. um, you will see that that they're not going to question if the local delegation is all on, on board okay. or something. It, it, it depends on the delegation. Well, Some the New Orleans there. delegation is almost never united on anything, and the well, Baton Rouge there. delegation is kind of the same way. Yeah. So. Well, there is life outside of Baton Rouge, New Orleans. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I want to go back to um, what she was saying about how we're kind of um, the constituents are stuck. Um, we're in the time right now with the state where we're stuck to where whether we want to raise taxes or cut a program. So um, my question is, whatever Republican nominee, whether it's Kennedy or whoever, how can they bring forth a plan? What plan do you think that they can bring forth that can kind of satisfy the constituents who are kind of don't want to raise taxes but don't want to cut a program? How would, how do you think that they can even approach the situation? I mean, I think, to be honest, I think in 2019, I'm not sure that the Republican nominee is going to have to really bring forward a plan. I think that they'll probably just hammer, especially if we renew some of these, extend some of these temporary taxes. If, if that happens, I think they'll just hammer the governor and raising uh, <coughs> Now it's a billion five worth of taxes. They'll probably save three billion if they renew the taxes to the same extent that they are now, and that's a big if. Um, I don't. We have had Republicans in the House who've been saying for two years now, through six sessions, that uh, they want to cut and they don't want to raise taxes, and they have still not really shown us how they would want to do so. Um, so unfortunately, unless someone pushes them to, you know, release a plan, you don't you don't really have to do that. And in a campaign, you don't really have to do that. I mean, I think, unfortunately, in a campaign, there's not a lot of you don't have to have a lot of detailed plans. I'll also remind you know I try to remind myself in 2015, our current governor said he could fix the budget without raising taxes. Only Jay Darden said he was going to have to raise taxes. David Vitter kind of didn't answer the question about whether he would have to raise taxes. Uh, Scott Angel and John Bell said that they didn't have to raise taxes to do it, that they could get rid of tax exemptions, they could get rid of special tax breaks. So, I mean, he's not going to have that talking point anymore in 2019. Um, so I, I know that's not answering your question really, but I think I'm, I don't think you'll see a Republican who will put forward a good plan. Well, and on that point, I think your question kind of gets at the heart of the debate that we see is, is there, there is a lot of discussion about does the state do more than it can afford to do? And lots of people have different philosophical positions about that, but when you start to dig down into it of which program do you think the state shouldn't pay for anymore? Do you think that we shouldn't have, you know, uh, this healthcare program, or we shouldn't do have this college open, or we shouldn't? W when you get to that level of discussion, nobody ever presents a very specific plan. You see a lot of people say, "Well, we think spending in the health department is too big." Okay, well, here are the list of optional programs that, under federal law, you don't have to fund if you want to have a Medicaid program. Which one would you like to cut? The Department of Health and Hospitals has submitted a couple options of programs to cut, and the legislature rejects eliminating those programs because those are things that are like helping disabled children or um, helping uh, teens who have mental health issues or substance abuse problems. I mean, these obviously get to very touchy areas, but you will hear a lot of Republicans say, well, the governor picks cabinet secretaries <laughs> to run these departments. We should be able to give them a figure, and they should have to run. 
and they should have to make those decisions. So there is a lot of debate about who's in charge of determining where the cut should fall because you don't necessarily want to be the politician who's blamed for eliminating something. And, and, and that's the heart of the, the ongoing saga. All right, so we're an hour in, but maybe one or two more questions quick. Uh, Will? So New Orleans is on the uh, rank of major history with uh, like an African-American people down there. Uh, does uh, the election of one versus the other do better for John Bell Evans? And uh, that means Ms. Landrieu will not be in office. And whether Ms. Landrieu and the Landrieu's in the future of Louisiana. Jeremy, I, uh, Jeremy, question. I just recorded a, a one-hour podcast with Mitch Landrieu that was released today. You can find it at lapolitics.com. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, I asked him what, what he's going to do, um, and, and he said he doesn't have any plans that I asked him if, if he would ever consider running for governor again, and he said that he would not have taken down Confederate monuments in Louisiana if he thought he was ever going to run for governor in the state. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a, a funny question about where the governor is on uh, this, this mayoral race, because he has stayed out. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say because you have members of his, his team, uh, especially the folks who are working on, on street levels, who were divided. Then you got some working for Desiree Charbonnet, you got some working for Latoya Cantrell. Um, but uh, you know, right now it, look, it looks like it's it's, it's going to be a it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a real fight, and it seems like locals are, are eager to give the edge to Latoya Cantrell. One more, somebody? Yes, sir. Uh, I was just curious with the removal of Confederate statues in Louisiana. Do you believe we're slowly kind of uh, get rid of the plaques that are kind of like around Louisiana, like in Opelousas, where right when you're entering the city from sunset, you have a small plaque of like where the Battle of Opelousas or the Camp in Opelousas was for the Confederate soldiers. Do you believe that with the removal of Confederate statues, you'll slowly see the removal of those? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not well, sure. You, you interviewed, interviewed the author about his future plans. Well, the author said he, yes, the, I interviewed the author of the, one of the authors, there were two bills, two, right, this time? Yes. Two yes. bills. And he said, he said, in his last story, basically he said he thought the tide had turned, he said he's not going to bring the bill back up again. He thought that, he said, he says, you know, I think the way it looks to me now, everything's going to come down. He, was not, know, he wasn't happy about it. But it's I, probably I going to be a local by local right. decision. I feel like it's going to be local governing body like by local governing body that's going to make those decisions because right now you don't see any movement to, to get something passed at the state level. So it's going to be your police juries and your parish councils and those kind of things that are probably going to make those decisions. I was just, I was just curious because like in Mansfield you have the, uh, you have the Civil War Museum about Mansfield. I don't, like, I personally don't, and it was my opinion, they wouldn't take down that, but they'll maybe take down their small plaques where it may be like small like camps or battles for I'm not sure. Now, Jeremy, I mean, good Jeremy, the professor Jeremy says, we got one more question, so anybody? He's had his hand up a long, long time. Yes. Uh, in, throughout the history of Louisiana, we've had a lot of different constitutions. You, you uh, shot that down earlier, but could you sound more? Why do you think, is anyone talking about uh, redoing? We've had 40 years of this constitution about having uh, a constitutional convention in Louisiana? Yeah. I'm. I'm currently writing a book about the 1973 Constitutional <laughs> Convention that, that comes out next fall. Um, <laughs> um, there's, there's one bill for a limited Constitutional Convention that has uh, been repeatedly introduced by Neil Abramson uh, that you'll probably see more of. Uh, but like I said earlier, there's a real move to make this a, an issue in 2019, which is really the only way it's going to come about. The reason the 73 convention happened is because Edwin Edwards had campaigned on a constitutional convention. Uh, so he, he was kind of the wind at, at the back of that, that convention. And uh, we also had another constitutional convention that many people forget about, a limited one in the 1990s that was spearheaded by Mitch Landry when he was in the, in the, in the State House. And he talks about the history of that on, on, the, on the new podcast. And it's, it's, it's a, some interesting history. And it's, you can see the pitfalls and the mistakes that are easily made when you get into a constitutional convention. Why would anybody, why would anybody want to change this beautiful constitution that only had 350 amendments? <laughs> well, so, 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 so,
So yeah, to Jeremy's point, I, you're probably going to, I mean, until it, it is clear that there is not support for that in the Senate at all right now, but in 2019, in that set of elections, you're going to see a lot of people term limited out of the Senate. You're going to see more House members moving to the Senate. So the, the change in that dynamic may, may create a shift, but there's generally critics of a constitutional convention are concerned about opening up the document and then who gets to rewrite it and, and what level of influence will come from politicians, from lobbying groups and those kind of things. There's just generally a fear about, um, you may not like the document you have, but what are you getting into and what comes next? And the uncertainty seems to be a driving um, point of fear that is enough that, that nobody wants to, to open it up right now, at least um, they haven't been able to get enough votes so far. But I do think, to Jeremy's point, that election cycle is going to shake things up. People are going to run on Constitutional Convention as an issue. And it, it's going to, when the old senators kind of get turned out and the new folks come in, that's going to change the, the, the people who are having the debate. And you, you got to remember, too, that most of the, the recent efforts, real efforts that, to, to call a Constitutional Convention, have focused on a limited convention on articles, what, three and five, five and seven? All the ones that deal with budget and taxes, basically. And, and that's that's probably what you're going to see. And, and really, at the end of the day, you can probably do that with a set of constitutional amendments as well. I also think, like, like just to put it in perspective, the current legislature couldn't even pass a budget before their regular session deadline. Like, I think there are legitimate concerns from lawmakers that maybe having agreement on something like the state constitution, this current group, that would be a difficult task. That's why you don't want legislators necessarily involved as delegates. Yeah. The same the same year that Louisiana passed its constitutional convention, Texas did the exact same thing, except only legislators were allowed to serve as delegates. Their constitution failed, ours passed. And it's incredibly tough. Only one constitution has been passed since we passed ours. And it was in the early 80s by Georgia, and it's technically not a real constitution. It was like little pieces of a constitution. Uh, so uh, you could argue that Louisiana has the last constitution in the United States, but the point is it's pretty difficult. And I mean, you also look at the things that people complain about with this constitution. The legislature has debated undoing them or rewriting them or redoing them, and they never get the votes for that. So if they can't get the votes to, to, to piecemeal some of these things together, it makes it um, seem incredibly hard to get the votes for a new cons an entirely new constitution or section of the constitution. Well, thanks for everyone for, for showing up, and um, I'm sure they're going to stick around for a second. So, if anyone has any follow-up questions, you know, feel free to come up. But otherwise, let's give them a round of applause.